Love, a force both gentle and mighty, has the extraordinary power to transform hearts and souls. It is a beacon of light that guides us through the darkest of storms, a force that reshapes us and the world around us. Imagine, if you will, the vast, boundless ocean, a sea that knows no end, filled with countless mysteries and hidden depths. In its waves, we discover the essence of Jesus' earthly ministry, a ministry that washed over humanity like a cleansing rain, offering new life and hope. On this sacred day of Monday Thursday, we gather in worship to commemorate Christ's humble and loving sacrifice for us. Recognizing that his actions were firmly grounded in the profound and transformative power of love. A love that flows from the heart of our triune God. In the quietude of that upper room where the disciples gathered with their Lord, a remarkable event transpired. Jesus, knowing that his time had come, rose from the table and took a basin and a towel. He knelt before his disciples and began to wash their feet. Can you imagine the humility in his actions? The Son of God, the King of Kings, performing this simple act of service. In this humble act, he revealed a new way, a new paradigm of relationship with the divine, a way rooted in love. He said, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. The commandment was clear. Love, selfless and unconditional love, was to be the hallmark of his followers. This was not just any love, but a love that mirrored his own, a love that transcended boundaries, a love that served and gave without expecting anything in return. Monday Thursday challenges us to rethink our relationship with ourselves, God, and others. It invites us to see the face of God in one another and to be vessels of love, compassion, and service in a world often filled with division and discord. In this new way, we are called to join with Jesus in breaking down the barriers that separate us, to extend the hand of kindness to our neighbors, to offer the refreshment of grace and the cleansing of reconciliation, reflecting the triune nature of the divine, where grace, forgiveness, and love flow together. In recognizing the profound love that Christ offers us, we also acknowledge the gift of grace and forgiveness that he extends to each of us. As we open our hearts to his love, we find ourselves bathed in the waters of his grace, washed clean by the gift of his forgiveness. This act of grace, this embrace of forgiveness, empowers us to become instruments of love in the world. We are not only recipients of this divine love, we are invited to be conduits of it, reflecting the unity of the Holy Trinity. As we honor the legacy of Jesus Christ on this Monday Thursday, let us remember that his commandment is not only about words, but about actions. It is about living out his love, his grace, and his forgiveness as we become beacons of hope in a world that so desperately needs it. May this Monday Thursday be an invitation to join Jesus in lovingly and humbly serving the world around us. In the simplicity of love and service, we discover a profound connection with the divine, a connection that transcends time and place and renews our spirits for the journey ahead.
Okay, welcome to the celebration of Holy Communion. If you need an elephant and don't have the elements, raise your hand. Or if you're at home watching, hit pause and go get your elements and come back and hit play again. In communion, we participate in the death and resurrection of our Lord who shed His blood on the cross and rose from the dead so that our sinful nature might be put to death in His death. And He rose up into holiness and into eternal life in His resurrection that we one day too might have eternal life in the fullness of it with Him forever. When we celebrate communion, we partake of the bread and the cup in remembrance and in communion with our Savior through the Holy Spirit. And we are proclaiming His death until He comes. Now let's hear what the Word of the Lord has to say. Quoting from the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26, Paul said to the church members in Corinth, and to us today. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this bread and cup and ask you to bless and consecrate these elements representing our spiritual participation and the body and blood of Christ. United with us in our humanity, he has an undying love and grace and to the life he shares with you and the Holy Spirit. Help us know and believe in the communion that we have with you and with one another. We pray all things through the intercession and mediation of the Son and the Spirit giving honor to you, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit forever. Amen. Let us take the bread. Jesus took the bread and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of Christ the bread of God. Jesus took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Hey everyone. As a boy, I loved daydreaming. I would get to the end of the day, I would go take my bath uh, or shower like uh, you know most of us would, and I would get into bed and I would start having all these fantasies that would go through my head. And in most of these fantasies, I would be the hero of the story. Whether it was a Lord of the Rings style thing where I was some sort of adventurer, or whether it was just me um, playing a game of cricket and hitting every ball for a six 
and taking everybody out uh, while bowling and just getting golden ducks. Every single night I would go to bed and I had these fantasies where I was the hero of the story, where I was the person that had, was having the spectac spectacular effect on the world. How many of you have had that as well in your life, where you've had this, uh, these fantasies of you being something more than what you currently are? Have these fantasies where you become the important person, where you are the one that's got the power. And for most of us, like for me, at school, when I had somebody bullying me, you know, I'd come home in the evening and I would be the one that would get the best of bully, but the next day at school, it never really turned out like that at all. Have you had dreams like those? Well, it turns out that even Jesus' disciples, the 12 apostles, had illusions of power. Even they were in a position where at times they were vying for position with Jesus, hoping that they would have more influence and would get a better seat um, at the table and, and have more power. They thought that the proximity that they had to Jesus, how close they were to Jesus, would give them better standing with him. Do you sometimes seek influence and power like that? Do you believe that more money or influence that you can have in this life would make you a better person, would give you more of the stuff that you want. You see, the problem that we sit with as Christians is, is that we need to recognize that that sense of pride, that sense of I want power, that was there before the world was created, right? When Satan was cast down from heaven, the reason why he was cast down from heaven was because he wanted to be equal with God. So it's important for us to note this. Because power ultimately corrupts. And we're going to be talking about this a little bit today. Now, this shouldn't be a revelation to you, this idea that power corrupts. How many times in history have we seen good men, good women, that succumb to the allure of power and of money? Uh, this is true for Christians. This is true for Catholics. This is true for Protestants. Many instances where power has led to Good people making really bad decisions and doing really bad things. In 1887, a British historian called Lord Acton famously wrote a letter to Bishop Emmanuel Creighton. And in this letter, he said the following, Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Great men are almost always bad men. Acton argued that historians must uphold moral dangers of unchecked authority and the tendencies for individuals in positions of significant power to lose their moral compass and not shy away from criticizing historical figures for their moral failures, regardless of their achievements and the context of their actions. His assertion was, therefore, that power tends to corrupt and absolute power cor corrupts absolutely, was a warning against uh, people that use their influence and use their power ultimately and ultimately lose their way. The good news for us as Christians is that Jesus was very much in tune to the fact that human beings suffer from this problem. And so he actually took important steps in the Bible to help regulate that and to help um, address the specific issue. In John 13 verses 34, Jesus says something that was very radical for his day. He says to his disciples, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Now, why am I talking about this today? Why am I talking about this on Maundy Thursday? Well, it's because Christ gave us an example on the day that we now call Maundy Thursday of how we should deal with the issue of power. You see, Maundy Thursday, also known as Holy Thursday, is an important day in the Christian calendar. The term Maundy comes from the Latin word mandatum, meaning commandment. It refers to this commandment in John 13 verses 34, where Jesus instructs his disciples to love one another, that commandment that he gives to love one another. Additionally, Maundy Thursday is also associated with the act of Jesus washing his disciples' feet, probably one of the, the most a visible ways in which Jesus demonstrated that somebody that is in a position of power shouldn't use his power to flaunt it over other people's, but should rather use the, this power to serve other people. It's part of the season in that you have Morning Thursday, Good Friday, which observes the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, 
Holy Saturday, which is um, also known as the Easter Vigil, which marks Jesus' body laying in the tomb. And then finally, Easter Sunday, where Jesus is then risen from the grave, resurrected from the grave, right? Which celebrates Jesus' victory over death. So how did Jesus address this issue of power um, with regards to the Last Supper? We're going to pick this story up a little bit before the Last Supper, but we're going to dial into the Last Supper to get a little bit, bit more context about how Jesus wanted to address the issue of Christians in positions of power and how they should act towards one another. But before we do that, we just need to set the stage correctly. So we turn to Luke 9, um, Luke chapter 9, verses 43 to 48. In verse 43, We read the following. While everyone was marveling at all what Jesus did, he said to his disciples, Listen carefully about what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand what this meant. It was hidden from them, so they did not grasp it, and they were afraid to ask him about it. Listen carefully to this. An argument started among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child and and made him stand beside him. Then he said to them, Whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For it is the one who is least among you who is the greatest. So the disciples got embroiled in a bit of an argument. They wanted to know who is going to be the most important. Who is the person that's closest to Jesus? Who's got the most power? Who gets as much shine as possible from, from Jesus? And they were having this argument. And Jesus was like, guys, guys, you're completely misunderstanding it. You think that power has got to do with the proximity closest to me. You think that power has got to do with how much influence you have. You think that power has got to do with how much money perhaps you have. You know, there was this, Judas was kind of uh, accused of being a bit of a money grubber, right? That was part of, of the things that we historically learn about Judas. He's saying to them, this is how you see the world, that these things are important. I'm telling you, it's not important. The things that are really important in this world is your ability to serve other people. And so he illustrates it by saying that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. The people that think that they are great will be the least in the kingdom. And those that think the least of themselves will be the greatest. Now, let's get to the Last Supper, because this is kind of where it all comes together. We pick up the story in Luke chapter 22, but it's important to note that all four Gospels, all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, mention the Last Supper. Now, it's very important for you to know this because whenever you see all four of the canonical Gospels mention a specific event, that is really important. All four of the authors wanted to bring our attention to this. So when you read them in tandem with one another, you get a very nuanced picture of what's going on. We're going to primarily focus on Luke and John for this message, but I encourage you to look at the the other Gospels. I'll give it to you quickly. Um, It was Matthew 26. You can read that in verse 20 to 29. Mark 14, verses 70 to 24, uh, 25. And Luke 22, verses 70 to 24. And then John 13, verses 1 to 13. Okay, but back to back to the book of Luke. So in Luke 22, Jesus and his disciples are gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. During this last supper, he had now instituted this one. We're going to pick up the story here. He'd instituted the last supper. He'd given the symbols and explained their meaning, right? The symbols meaning uh, the bread and, of course, the wine, which we share during communion, which is also co- commonly called the Eucharist. So Jesus shares this with his disciples, and then he tells them something very important. He says to them that somebody is going to betray him, right? He's been prepping them uh, earlier on in Luke. He had told them that the Son of Man would be handed over. They didn't understand what that means. Now he's trying to tell them again that bad things are going to happen to him, okay? And he says to them that somebody that's at the table, somebody who's there that evening will betray them, obviously referring to Judas Iscariot. But let's pick up the the story in Luke 22, verses 20, and see how it plays out. So in verse 20, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. So he's saying, there's somebody here at the table who is going to betray me. 
The son of man will go as it's been decreed, but woe to the man who betrays him. So Jesus is kind of saying to Judas, dude, I know what you're going to do, but woe to you. Horrible things are going to happen because of the decisions that you're making this evening. So, verse 23, they began to question among themselves which of them it might be that would be doing this. Very natural, because Jesus just said one of them is going to betray them. But look at the next sentence. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them is to be the greatest. Hang on. Jesus just told them that somebody is going to betray him, right? He's explained to them that this is going to, this is going to radically alter their world. And the discussion that they then have with one another, the argument that breaks out, is not about how can we help Jesus. It's not about what we're going to do, you know, going forward. No, no, it's about who is going to be the greatest among them. Verse 25. So Jesus says to them, this is so important. The kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, the fact that they are king, right? And those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. So we'll have somebody like Bill Gates, for example, lots of money. He, he goes everywhere and he dishes out money through his foundations and he helps lots of people. And everybody's like, oh, Bill Gates, this is a nice guy, right? He's our benefactor. So he sets up the stay. I'm just using Bill Gates as an example. It can be a whole bunch of different people, right? But the idea is, is there's, there's a us, there's a us, the, the common people, and then there's these people that are much better and, and greater than us. So they, they set themselves as benefactors. But you are not like that, he says to his disciples. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest or the least. And the one who rules like the one who is a servant, who serves. Now, this is important because this sets very different dynamics and very different goals for people that are in the church. It's not about who has the most power. It has not got anything to do with who's got the most money or the most influence, but rather it's got to do with how that person uses his money, his influence, and his power to serve other people. That should be the goal of everybody that takes up a leadership role in the church. And don't think just because all that you do is you're involved in you know, serving tea or washing dishes or maybe you are running the praise and worship that you're not in a position of authority. Eventually, we all get to some sort of position of authority. And we have this ability to lord it over one another. Even if it's not in the church, it will be in our house. And we should be first and foremost Christians that follow the example and the practice of Jesus. So amongst this, um, amongst this profound and solemn moment where Jesus just explained to them that he's going to die, because he explained to them what the symbols are, right? And he explained to them that he will be handed over and that somebody at the table will betray them. The disciples then start trying to bicker about who's the greatest, so how does Jesus address the issue? How does he correct their thinking? Because he said to them, guys, you are not like the people of this world. You're not like the rulers of the world. So how does he then try to correct their thinking? Now, John 13 gives us a magical insight, fantastic insight as to how Jesus' mind worked to try and show these disciples of him how they should act. We pick up in verses 3. So John 13 verses 3. <clears throat> Let's start reading there. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. This is important for us to understand because there are people out there, uh, different religions, other people out there that say, well, Jesus was just a good guy. Jesus was just a nice guy. He was just a guru, but he wasn't God, right? And sometimes if you have that at the back of your head, if you think in those kind of lines, oh, he was just like Nelson Mandela, he was just like Mahandi, Mahatma Gandhi, for example. If you think like that, you don't realize that he was in a position of power. Jesus was fully in control of whether he would die on the cross or not, right? He says later that, he, that nobody takes his life from him, but that he lays it down willingly. Very important. So he's in a position of power, not in a position of weakness. Verse 4. So he got it from the mill, took, out his, uh, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus said, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. Verse 8, no, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. 
Isn't that interesting that Jesus is trying to illustrate to, him, to Peter here that the power differential between them means that from God's perspective, Jesus needs to serve him. That's where it comes in. To, to what, what comes into the picture here. He's trying to show Peter that Peter would have to serve other people in the church. And if Peter is not prepared to adopt this philosophy, if Peter wants to always be the greatest guy in the room, the most powerful guy, the guy with the most influence, if he doesn't get that, how can he then be the one on which Jesus will eventually build the church? So he says to him, you can't have any part of me. Verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put, he put on his clothes and he returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. Interesting question. Do you really understand what I have done for you? It's not just, oh, I washed your feet. No, no. I'm in a position of power and I am serving you. I don't need to do this, but I do this willingly because that is God's way. Verse 13, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash another, uh, one another's feet. This, come back to, this comes back to uh, John 13, verses 34, where Jesus says, I give you a new commandment, right? Love one another as I have loved you. The bar is set very high. Verse 15, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. That is a complete mind shift from the way the world works. In the world out there, the people that have power... Don't serve the people that don't have power. The people that have money, ignore the people that don't have money. They might donate money to them. Sure, fair enough. But will they go and stand in a soup kitchen and serve them? Very few people do. You look at an example, I think it was Abraham Lincoln, if I'm not mistaken, who was the president of the United States. And for many years after he had been president, he was still going to his local church and mowing the lawn every week. That was his job. He did that, but he was a president. Why? Because he understood the principle. He understood that a man that is in great power or a woman that is in great power, if they do not want that power to corrupt, they must serve their fellow Christians. They must serve their fellow Christians. So Jesus' response to the dispute was by contrasting the concept of leadership and greatness in the kingdom of God versus leadership and greatness in the secular world. And in Luke 22 that we just read, Jesus explained that for you to be great, you need to be the least. For you to be powerful, you need to serve other people. Powerful in the context of God, what God wants us to do, right? He points out that even though he is their teacher and their master, he has served them. He is the one that has served them like that. And he says to us, all of us Christians, that we are supposed to do the same. This teaching flips the conventional understanding and the power dynamic of authority on its head. It emphasizes humility and service and sacrificial love as the true measure of greatness in the kingdom of God. Now, knowing this, look at other churches, other congregations, even your own congregation, and ask yourself, does the pastor in the congregation serve his congregation? Does the pastor serve his people? I'm not just talking about he prefers messages, but is he prepared to serve individual people? It's very important, right? Because that is the true mark. What do we often find? We often find that the pastors start driving flashier cars. If you think of like mega churches, for example, they're buying very expensive uh, 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 jets. Um, and flying all over the place, fantastic cars, fantastic clothes, you know, they spend a lot of money. But is that the purpose of the church? We've seen in Africa where there are many places in Africa where people are poor, that there are mega churches with pastors that seem to have absolute affluence. They've got this power and then they, they'll, they'll do stuff where they say to the, well, oh, you pay a certain amount of money and then I will pray over this holy water and I will send it to you. That is not God's way. That is not 
God's way, health and wealth, all that kind of stuff, none of that speaks to the gospel. How is that person serving his congregation? But don't just look at the pastors and say, oh, the pastors are bad. We need to internalize this for ourselves as well. We need to look at Monday, Thursday and say, this is not just about people that in obvious places in leadership. But how do I serve the people if I'm in the music ministry? How do I serve my congregants uh, and the children if I'm in the children's ministry? How do I serve the elderly in my congregation? How do I serve the weak or the poor or the sick? These are all the things that this example tries to elevate in us. So that we don't just look at ourselves and say, oh, I'm the certain holier than thou individual. I'm better than everybody else. I don't need to do these things. No, we have to. The power of the kingdom of God does not look like the power of the kingdom of man. On earth, we want to elevate our position. We want to be special. We want to be the hero of the story. We want it to be treated as such. We want to be important. But none of that matters to God. In heaven, it's the first that shall be last and the last that shall be first. In heaven, those that made it by the skin of their teeth. Think of the thief on the cross. And those that serve Jesus their entire life are valued by both value. In heaven, we are all saints, not by our doing, but by the grace of God and his forgiveness. It's by the saving grace of Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. True power, God's power, the way that God sees uh, the world, stems from love and self-discipline. It comes from valuing the, valuing the things of the world less and valuing the things of God more. It comes from denying the self and serving God and our fellow man. You see, Jesus showed that there was more to his life, death and resurrection, just empty words. He wasn't just like many pastors out there that say the words and then don't do it. He lived with people. He healed people. He healed the sick. There are so many stories in the New Testament where you see where Jesus enters into the humanity of God. Ordinary people, people that have been sidelined by society, beggars, prostitutes, lepers, the outcasts of society. And that's what makes Jesus so is because he is able to reach into the lives of these people and effect real change in them. To show them that from God's perspective, they are loved. Many people don't feel loved in the world that we live in. And where people of authority have the ability to show them God's love, I think that's got a real, real benefit. In other words, if Christ is willing to humble himself to his followers, shouldn't his disciples be prepared to do the same? If we look at the example that Jesus has set for us and the commandments has given to us, should we not be prepared to do these same things? In a world that is consumed with the allure of power, the example that Jesus Christ gave us is refreshing, completely different. And we can see the impact that it's had on our lives and the lives of other people. No one on this planet has had the impact that Jesus has had. And he did it from a position of power, but while serving others. Let us then be the same in our communities, in our church. Let us not think of ourselves more and greater than other people, but let us be humble and show the world the love of God as he has shown us love and compassion. I hope you have a wonderful Easter season and may God bless you during this time. Darkness flee
at his command Who is this king? Who is this king? His name is Jesus His name is Jesus Light of the world There's freedom in His name Awesome in power Reigning forever Light of the world There's freedom in His name The healers in the rain The benediction is taken from 2 Peter 1, verses 2 to 3. May grace and peace 
be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Amen.